So there's all kinds of information here about John, but we probably know him quite well, right? So go ahead, John. Hey, thank you. Yeah, as was mentioned, I work for, as an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. Uh, my clients are farmers, agronomists, um, conventional, organic. So if you see things on your farm or a field that you're looking at and you're not sure what it is and what it's doing, if it's good or bad, uh, feel free to contact me. You can send me photos. We can help you with that. But I'm here today to speak about good bugs, natural enemies. And when we talk about diversity, there is nothing more diverse than insects. There is a million species of insects identified in the world, and we think there's a lot more than that. They are the most diverse group of anything in the world. So can't get more diverse than that. Now, what I'm going to talk about is, again, the good guys. And I'm going to start by just going over what insects are doing on your farm. We often focus on just the ones that eat the crops or attack your livestock. But there's a lot more going on than that. Someone touched on pollinators earlier. We've got things that uh, move from plant to plant, pollinating your plants. Uh, we've got a lot of insects that eat other insects. Huge group. I'm going to cover quite a few of those. We have a lot of insects that eat weeds and weed seeds, ground beetles, field crickets. There's a lot of things that will feed on weed seeds, so they can be very helpful that way. You've got your decomposers. Uh, a lot of insects feed on either plant material or dead animal material and help that regenerate. That's an important part of the natural cycle and process. Insects contribute to that. They improve the soil structure. And then, of course, there are those that do feed on the crops. But overall, you do not want a farm setting without insects because, again, there's some that do feed on the crops, but there's a lot more that are helping improve your bottom lines and your yields and your crops. You need those ones. And the fine balance we have in agriculture is, how do you keep all the good guys that are helping improve my crop and somehow manage the pest ones that are eating my crops? That's always a fine line and a, a battle, and there are ways we can get around that. Uh, before I get into showing you some of the, the good bugs that are on your farm and how you can enhance them, here's a quote from somebody from McGill University. That diversity is expected, on average, to give rise to ecosystem stability. So basically, the more diverse the landscape is, the more stable it's going to be. When we get outbreaks of insects, often the cause is we've made our our landscape, our ecosystem, too simple. And it's allowing one organism to basically take over. So things that have been suggested already, having crop diversity, intercropping, uh, the more diversity you can have in a system, the less likely something is going to take over that system. So I'm gonna, go th I'm gonna start by going through a few groups of beneficial insects, and we'll have a look at what they're doing on your farm. And then we're going to have a look at how do you maybe alter or change the landscape to try to encourage these things and keep them around your farm. So the first group I'm going to go over is our helpful Hemiptera. Hemiptera is your true bugs. For an entomologist, uh, if you use the term bug, it's Hemiptera. To most people, a bug is any insect. But technically, to an entomologist, it's this group here, Hemiptera which means half wing in entomology terminology. And I've actually got questions here, so uh, we'll see with the big group if we can make this work. The first group of helpful hemiptera here are minute insects. They've got a kind of a skull and crossbone pattern on their wings like a pirate, and they're true bugs. So does anyone want to take a stab at what these might be? You can just yell it out if you want to. So, um, minute pirate bug is the, the English term to it. You'll often see the terms, uh, Anthocoridae is the family or the group. Um, sometimes they will use some of the genus names. Minute pirate bug is the name of them. They're, they're usually two or three millimeters long, so they're small. These guys like to feed on insect eggs, mites, thrips, aphids, so very small prey. That's what they're feeding on. They can be extremely abundant. Uh, 
there was a study done in Manitoba here where they were looking at the most abundant predators in soybean fields, feeding on soybean aphid. These were number two after lady beetles. They often get overlooked because they are so tiny, but they're extremely beneficial. Again, they're eating a lot of those small insects in your field. Uh, what they do is they, they've got a beak, they poke their beak into their prey, they inject some enzymes in that starts digesting it, then they suck the juice out of their prey. So that's how they're feeding. All the true bugs have a beak for a mouth part and have a feeding system similar to that. Uh, so here's some data on how many, uh, in this case it's soybean aphids, one of these individuals can feed on in a day. So fifth instar, so that's the fifth juvenile stage. Each pirate bug was feeding on eight aphids per day on average, and for an adult female, it's 11 aphids per day per individual. So when you have a lot of these in the field, that certainly helps out. Um, what I'll do, maybe I'll, give you, I'll show you the picture, then I'll just give you my answers, just to keep us moving, because if not, I'll probably go over 40 minutes. Um, so this one here, it's a very long, slender insect, and we call them damsel bugs. And we, probably they're called damsel bugs. They, they don't look like a very intimidating insect. They're very quick. They're moving around a lot. And they've also got this beak. And the way they feed is they're, they're quick. They'll run up to a piece of prey, a diamondback moth, caterpillar or something. They poke their beak in. They inject some toxins. Then they kind of wait for their prey to stop kicking. And then they suck the juices out of it. Very similar to minute pirate bug. They can be very numerous. Um, we did a study a couple years ago on aphids in cereal crops. And in Manitoba, they were one of our dominant um, predators. After your, your ladybugs and lacewings, uh, they were one of the dominant ones. So they can be very valuable. Now, they will feed on small things like aphids. They will feed on some larger caterpillars as well. In fact, um, diamondback moth is one they often feed on. The picture I showed you is one particular species. It's a group called Nabis, but there's actually several different types or species of these in Manitoba. In fact, there's 22 species in Canada for um, damsel bugs. So they are somewhat diverse. Now here's some stats. Uh, the experiment here maybe was a bit contrived. What they did was they, were, they took some damsel bugs, put them in a container, they didn't feed them for a while. They got them good and hungry. Then they started dropping diamondback moth larvae in. And on average, uh, they ate about 131 eggs or 95 uh, diamondback moth larvae in 24 hours. Now, again, that might be a bit contrived because they were hungry to start. They didn't have to move for their food. It'd be like having me at a buffet, really, really hungry, and someone just keep bringing me plates all day. I'd probably eat more than I normally would. But the bottom line is they can eat a lot of, of caterpillars or insect eggs in a day. So if anyone wants to try that experiment, I'm game for it. Um, but big appetites, they are very valuable natural enemies. I mentioned they're quick to um, flea beetles. Someone mentioned flea beetles in their, um, or they didn't have a lot in their intercrop with their peas and canola. Flea beetles are one of the major canola pests in Manitoba. Now, damsel bugs probably don't eat a lot of them, but being a quick insect, they can catch the odd one. There's not too many predators that can actually track down and catch flea beetles. Uh, damsel bugs are one of uh, a very short list of insects known to actually feed on flea beetles, although they're probably not a big part of their diet. If there was some diamondback moth nearby that were much slower, easier pickings, I'm sure they'd go for those. The next group is your stink bugs. And anyone who maybe has studied some entomology, you might know stink bugs are actually a fairly diverse group. There's a subfamily of stink bugs that is strictly predaceous. So not all stink bugs are predators. There are some that are plant feeders. There's one or two that, at least further south, can be somewhat of a pest of corn. But then there's the subfamily that feeds on nothing but other insects, and they often like feeding on caterpillars. They will feed on potato beetles, uh, but I have seen stink bugs uh, with their beak into potato beetle larvae. In fact, I was rearing some monarch butterflies at my place last summer, and I came home one day to check on my caterpillars, and there was a stink bug with a beak into one of them. 
So obviously those caterpillars are toxic to most things, but the stink bugs were still having a good meal out of it. Not that I wanted them to be eating those caterpillars, but um, they do feed on lots of different insects, particularly caterpillars. So they can be good too. So this is a group I really like. They're called the lace wings, and there's different types of lace wings, green lace wings, brown lace wings. Uh, as adults, some are predaceous, some just feed on nectar and pollen. As larvae, they are strictly predaceous. Their larvae are alligator-shaped and brown. Uh, some people will call them aphid lions. They really like aphids. And They've got big sickle-shaped mandibles. When they see an aphid, they will come up to it, grab it with their mandibles. Again, they're injecting toxins in, and then they suck out the juice. The aphids will try to avoid them. I'll show you a video in a second of an encounter between a lacewing and an aphid. Um, green lacewings, again, they're um, valuable predators. They are somewhat diverse. Uh, there's about 26 species in Canada. Um, I've explained they already, they inject their digestive juices into their prey and they feed. Now, the video I'm going to show you here, I want you to have a look at one of the aphids being fed on. They've got kind of tailpipes in their back end and when the lacewing grabs it, you see drops coming out of the tailpipe. Those are pheromones that tell the other aphids, I'm being attacked, get out of here. Aphids communicate that way. Sometimes what happens is the aphids will stop, start dropping off the plant when they're being attacked, and then things on the ground, like ground beetles, can get them. So, oops, I'm going to have to go back here. I, for whatever reason, I'm not seeing the start key to my video. So we may have to skip the video here. My apologies for that. Uh, lace wings, they've been found to feed on diamondback moth cocoons, and they're one of the other insects that will feed on uh, flea beetles, potentially. Again, not a big part of their diet, but they are quick and they will occasionally feed on them. The photo that I showed you uh, earlier, I'll just go back a couple slides here. Uh, the photo that'll be on your right is a lacewing larva feeding on a ligus bug. Ligus bugs are also very quick. And I took this photo in an alfalfa field. This lacewing larva was feeding on a lagus bug nymph that had captured. So uh, they're certainly quick enough to chase down and catch things like lagus bugs. Okay, beneficial beetles. Uh, we've got a lot of different groups of beetles that are predators, so I can't cover them all. I'm just going to go over what I consider our top three or four groupings. The uh, first group here. One of the more diverse groups that we've got, these are the ground beetles or carabids. So we've got roughly 370 species of ground beetles in Manitoba, and there's about 980 species in Canada. So a very diverse group. These are the, um, they're usually black or brown beetles. When you turn over a board or, or um, kick over a clump of soil or looking under crop debris, and you see these black or brown beetles scurrying around, those are often ground beetles. Very diverse, they can be either really tiny or quite large. Um, the first couple of pictures on the screen are the adults. The one that looks kind of alligator shaped, which will be on your left, is the, uh, the larva of a ground beetle, which are also predaceous. Ground beetles, though, like bigger prey generally. They will feed on things like aphids, but some of them are pretty big. Some of your ground feeding caterpillars, like cutworms, army worms, Bertha army worm, uh, caterpillars that tend to be on the ground, they are very good at catching and feeding on those. In fact, one of my summer students brought in a, a very big ground beetle uh, that they found in the field in Carmen over the summer. And we kept it as a lab pet, and we were feeding it cutworms. And we were dropping six or seven cutworms per day into its container, and it would eat them all. And yeah, so some, some days my poor student had to go home and collect grubs out of her manure pile because um, our six or seven cutworms per day just weren't doing it. So they can have big appetites and uh, do a lot of good. And here's a list of things that ground beetles will potentially feed on. 
cutworms, potato beetle, eggs, larva, pupa, root maggots. Some species will actually get into the cracks in the soil, move around in the soil, feeding on things like root maggots, grasshopper eggs, things like that. So uh, wheat midge larva, they, wheat midge, um, they overwinter as larvae in the soil. Uh, ground beetles are one of the things that will feed on wheat midge larva as well. Uh, this is a study here done in Alberta. They were looking at uh, ground beetles as predators of cutworms, and they found seven species of ground beetles in that one field feeding on redback cutworm. So, again, quite diverse. They can certainly make a difference. And I should also mention that aside from being predators, we've got a couple different genuses of ground beetles that do like to feed on plant seeds on the ground, and can be very valuable predators of uh, weed seeds. And there's actually research going on uh, currently uh, across the prairies. There's two or three big studies going on right now where they're studying ground beetles as predators of weed seeds. So that's sort of an additional bonus to having them in the field. There's some species that will feed on both insect prey and weed seeds. So uh, double benefit to those species. Now here's a group that I think is really hugely underappreciated, the rove beetles. This is a group that a lot of people don't know about because a lot of people either don't see them or if they do see them, they don't know what they are because they're very tiny and they're usually in your soil or just scurrying around on the soil surface. What makes a rove beetle a rove beetle? It might be tricky to see, but these, the specimen on your right, if you look carefully on the back of it, it's a black insect, but you can see this area that almost looks orange along the back. Those are the wings. With rove beetles, the wings don't completely cover the abdomen. They usually come maybe a quarter or a half way down the abdomen, and the rest of the abdomen is exposed. And when they run away, they often um, will raise their abdomen. They, they will kind of crook it up. Uh, some people call them staff beetles because of the way they run with their abdomen up like this. Uh, but that's one of the defining features of the rove beetles. They, they have that exposed bit of abdomen underneath their very short elytra. They're very small. They're usually just a few millimeters. Super abundant. Look at the stats here. Uh, 390 species in Manitoba, over 1,700 species in Canada. So hugely abundant. They're in the soil. A lot of them are predators. They're feeding on, again, small things, insect eggs in the soil. They can be very efficient predators of root maggot eggs and larva. Um, so here's uh, some root maggots that we're feeding on. This is a cluster of root maggot eggs. So root maggots are those things that get into canola stems. If you're trying to grow radishes in your garden or broccoli, cauliflower, you pull up the roots, you get these maggots in there. That's root maggots. Um, they can be quite a nuisance, especially people trying to grow radishes and some of the... Uh, the rooting brassicas, uh, turnips, um, rove beetles, again, they're, they're not going to wipe out the root maggots in a field, but they would certainly help bring the population down. So they certainly do help out a lot. Okay, this was another quiz question. A lot of people get this one wrong. And this is one I think everyone should know. These black alligators, they're quite common. These are lady beetle larvae. Everybody knows what an adult lady beetle looks like but they don't start out as orange and black beetles. They have a larva stage, and the larva stage looks like a little alligator. And it's usually either black or gray with some orange or yellow markings on it. So get to know those. Those are good guys, and they're super abundant. Uh, a, a couple of times I've had people send me photos of these, and one sample came in to me. They were saying, these are all over our crop. Should we be spraying? And my answer is, you might want to look for aphids, but no, don't be spraying for lady beetles. These are strictly predators. Now, usually when you see a lot of them, you probably have had aphids already, and your aphid numbers may be getting quite low. We went into a hemp field a few years ago. A agronomist called me out and said, there's a really wicked aphid infestation in this hemp field, will you come look at it? Now, I was a bit delayed. I was busy that week. We went out the following week. We had trouble finding aphids. Lady beetle larva, lacewing larva, and hoverflies were super abundant. We could barely find an aphid on many of the plants. So they can do an extremely good job. And I've got some stats for you on these guys coming up too. 
So uh, lady beetles, we've got 66 species in Manitoba, and it might be cut off there, but there's 162 species in Canada. So they're fairly abundant. And here's some stats for you. A lot of lady beetles, when they get to be older larvae or adults, can eat over 100 aphids per individual per day. So they've got big appetites. They're hard ones to keep fed as well when you're trying to colonize them. So yeah, they're very beneficial. Uh, in a couple of different field crops, we do have what we call dynamic action thresholds, where what we've done is we've figured out in the past, so in the case of soybeans, it was figured out how many aphids are too many. Where is the point where they need to be controlled? Now, recently, we've gone one step further. We factored in predators like lady beetles, lace wings, pirate bugs, um, and a few other things into the economic threshold. So you're not just counting aphids, you're now counting all these natural enemies. And there can be times when you're above what would normally be considered the economic threshold, and you don't need to spray. Your best bet is to leave it alone. You've got enough natural enemies that they will take down the population. So for growers that are farming conventionally that are trying to at least reduce their input costs, we tell them, use these dynamic action thresholds, uh, get to know some of the natural enemies, factor them into your decision making, and uh, uh, you can save yourself a lot of money by doing this. Let the good guys do the work for you. So yeah, here's the, the one we use in soybeans. It's called aphid advisor. You punch in the temperature. The temperature will tell you how quickly your aphids are cycling. And then you have to enter several natural enemies, and it will spit out the decision for you that it recommends. Okay, so flies. A lot of people don't like flies because we've got a few species that are quite annoying. But believe it or not, we have a lot of good flies as well. So they're another good group to get to know. And this was my first quiz question. This is a toughie. And uh, this is a good one to get to know. My manager at work brought me a vial of these things um, last summer. He said, they're all over our wheat. Should we be spraying? The answer again was no, these are good. These are hoverfly larvae. So hoverfly, the, the, uh, the, the end that's uh, at the top here, that the tapered end is their mouth parts. They've got a hook for a mouth part. And what they do with that hook is they will go into an aphid colony and start impaling aphids. And then they hold the aphid up and they suck the juice out, kind of like a freezy being, uh, eaten down and then they put the aphid down and they'll impale another one and hold it up and suck the juice out. And if you ever get a chance to wash this in the field, it's very amusing and fun to do. Uh, but the, the adult hoverflies, I know you've all seen the adults. They're on, along the bottom here. Uh, the adults are bee and wasp mimics. And they come to flowering plants. They're also very good pollinators. But they will come to flowering plants. Um, if you see what looks like a bee or wasp, come to a flower and hover like a helicopter. That is a hoverfly. It's not a bee or a wasp. It cannot sting you. It's a fly. It's a good fly. And their larvae are strictly predators. They're, like I said, in the aphid colonies. The, the female adults know enough to lay the eggs right in or next to a, an aphid colony. So when the larvae hatch out, the larvae don't have legs, so when they hatch out, they don't have far to move. They just go into the aphid colony and start picking them off. So they're good guys, uh, super abundant. I'll go back a slide here. We've got over 500 species in Canada, so a super abundant group as well. Uh, I guarantee if you've got something flowering in your fields or your garden, you will see hoverflies. They will be in there. And if you've got aphids on any plants nearby where they are, that's where they're going to be laying their eggs. So super good guys. Don't be afraid of them. They can't sting you. They're not bees or wasps. And this is a bit of data on how many um, this aphids, in this case, hoverflies were eating in a study in Ontario. It's old data, but I still think it's one of the better studies on hoverfly consumption. And um, the third column in shows you the number of individual aphids that one hoverfly would eat in its larval life stage. And the far column is the number per day. And you can see that some, for most species, it's between about 15 and 25 aphids per day, or somewhere around three, 400 in their lifetime. But there are some species where it can be closer to 50 aphids per day and closer to 500 in their larval lifetime. So 
Uh, again, that all helps out. When you've got these guys and lady beetles and damsel bugs and pirate bugs feeding away, it makes a difference. And this is just another study um, on a specific species of hoverfly. In this case, it was eating about 400 aphids per day. Okay, this one is a tricky one. There's your answer. Um, I get a lot of questions in the springtime. People are often digging around in the soil for cutworms and wireworms in the spring, and they come across these white, very mobile worms that squiggle around. If you poke these things, they go snaky. They squiggle around like a snake would. Uh, they're very active, so obviously it's not a wireworm. Way too active and not the right color. It's not a cutworm. These are stiletto fly larvae. So stiletto flies are big, hairy flies. Their larvae live in the soil, and they feed on things in the soil. So things like cutworms, wireworms, whatever they can find. Now, I guess, unfortunately, they do feed on earthworms as well. They're not too selective. Whatever they can tackle in the soil, they'll feed on. But if you happen to have a lot of wireworms in your field, stiletto flies will help you out with that. And so here's the picture of the big hairy fly. Um, if you are in a field, you may see them early in the day landing on the plants. When the day gets warmer, they get very active. If you're, you're ever out sweeping in a field with a sweep net and you catch flies that almost look white, hairy and white, a uh, good chance that they're probably stiletto flies. And again, earthworms, wireworms, things like that are their food. One last group of flies I'd like to cover. Uh, very important group, and again, one that gets overlooked is called tachinid flies, a very diverse group. And the picture doesn't show it well, but tachinid flies are usually housefly-like, sometimes a bit larger. The end of their abdomen is usually very hairy or bristly. And oftentimes, again, if you're out scouting a crop with a sweep net, and you go out on a hot day in July and sweep away, you'll often get a lot of what look like houseflies coming out of the net. Uh, quite often, a lot of those will be tachinid flies. They can be quite abundant, very diverse. Um, about 736 species in Canada, so a fairly diverse group. What they do is they lay their eggs often on caterpillars or other insects. So people, uh, if you're scouting for armyworms or Bertha armyworm, every now and then you'll find a caterpillar that in behind the head there's a white spot on it. That's a tachinid fly egg. And when that egg hatches, the larva gets right inside the caterpillar. It lives inside the caterpillar. Sometimes they make a breathing hole. So if you look on the back of the caterpillar, you'll actually see a, almost looks like a blowhole. Uh, the photo here shows it, that the white patch on the back of this caterpillar, that's a tachinid breathing hole. So the larva can breathe. Uh, so you know this caterpillar is parasitized. It's not going to make it to the pupa stage. It'll die eventually. And... Uh, if you get enough of these things, they can help take a population down as well. And the last group I'm going to cover is wasps. When I use the word wasp, people usually automatically think of yellow jackets, but that's not what we're going to talk about here. There's thousands of species of wasps in Canada, and there's just a few that will bother you and sting you. There's a lot of wasps that are good and would never be able to sting you. And uh, the photo you see here is a type of wasp called Cotesia. And a couple years ago, we had a fairly decent population of armyworms in Manitoba. People were starting to spray for them. One of the growers um, just south of Carmen brought me a sample of armyworms from his field. And I wanted to use these for a crop diagnostic school I was teaching at. So I was keeping these in a big container. And uh, we were, my student came in from lunch one day and was looking in the container and was saying, something weird is happening. And we went and looked inside. And what you see on your left is a bunch of Cotesia larvae coming out of an army worm. When Cotesia lays its eggs, it doesn't lay just one. It lays anywhere from about 20 to 50 eggs in the same caterpillar. They're all the same age. So when the Cotesia larvae emerge from the caterpillar, it all happens instantaneously. And then you get this cluster of pupa, usually at the top of the plants. Uh, they can be quite beneficial. In fact, that sample that came in to me, 60% of the caterpillars had Cotesia in it. He ended up spraying the field. If he would have left it, two-thirds of his population would have been naturally killed. So they can be quite beneficial. Now, again, there can be cases where the armyworms are not heavily parasitized, are abundant, and we need to manage them. But there are other times when the natural enemies will do the job for us. 
And that's just one of our parasitic wasps. Uh, here's a table here showing you some of our key groups of parasitic wasps. There's a huge group called the ichneumonids, 2,000 species in Canada. A lot of people don't know what they are. Again, if you're doing a sweep net sample in a field on a hot day, you'll have a lot of tiny black specks that pop out of your net. They're not all little flies. Most of them are probably either ichneumonids or braconids. Two very abundant groups, 2,000 species of ichneumonids, about 830 species of braconids in Canada. So very abundant groups. Um, again, one of our probably more underestimated groups of insects, your parasitic wasps. Super abundant, super helpful, but harder to identify. You have to have good eyes and know what you're looking for. Now here's one that anyone growing cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli wants to get to know. This one's called diadegma. Diamondback moth blows up from the U.S. on the winds every year. They get into your crucifer vegetables. They can make a mess of them. They're really hard to control. Sometimes, even with the natural enemies, we still have to do additional things. But there is a parasitic wasp called diadegma insulare, and it gets blown in some years with the diamondback moth, and they're laying eggs into those larvae. In years when they're abundant, they can really knock a population back. Um, Diamondback moth goes through three or four generations here, and we have seen years where the first generation was quite high, but then things just drop right off. And um, in some of those years when we've been dissecting larvae, it's because of diadigma. So they can be good. Now, things that you can do to help out some of your natural enemies. Here's a study uh, from the U.S. Diadigma insulare, they like flowers. The larvae are the things that are feeding on your diamondback moth. The adults feed on nectar. So it's good to have some flowering resources around your farm year round. There's a lot of different parasites that are in your fields at different times of the year. Having something flowering, especially if it's a small garden or patch, have, having something flowering nearby is really, really helpful. A lot of natural enemies like them. Here's another one, I'll just show this one quickly. Uh, this is one of our ichneumonids, a big orange wasp called Bancus flavescens. Uh, it attacks Bertha armyworm, and the caterpillar that we're showing here has a, a uh, Bancus larva coming out the back end of it. That's what the white thing coming out is. And a study done in Manitoba here, it's an older study again. Uh, we had a huge outbreak in the mid-70s of Bertha armyworm. It collapsed on us after a couple of years, and when they started looking at what was taking that population down, over 40% of the larvae had this bank of flavescence in it. So when they're abundant, they can do a good job bringing down our populations. There's the Cartesia again. Um, that picture at the bottom, a couple of years ago, and even this past summer, I had a lot of growers sending me photos in July saying, what are these eggs at the top of my cereal plants? And they're not eggs, those are the pupa clusters of Cotesia. So that Cotesia parasite I showed you earlier, after they've all come out of the armyworm and they're at the top of the plant, they form these pupa clusters at the top of the canopy. So if you see that, that's not insect eggs, that's a parasite that's been working in your field. And if you're seeing a lot of it in your field, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So something to look for. Um, Here's another quiz question I had. Sometimes people will see a lot of these uh, small little oval-shaped corpses on their plants and not know what they are. These are aphid mummies, so not actively feeding aphids, aphid mummies. An aphid mummy is something that's been parasitized by a parasitic wasp. The wasp will lay their eggs right into the small little aphids. The wasp larva makes a home out of the aphid, eats the insides out, now, eventually, instead of just dying and shriveling away, the aphid becomes a hard house for that wasp larva. So this is your aphid mummy. Eventually, the wasp larva will cut a hole in the side of it and emerge. But in the meantime, it's made a home out of that aphid. You can see in the picture here, a couple of them, you can see the holes in the back of them. That's where the parasitic wasp would have emerged from to go look for more aphids to lay more eggs into. 
And these can be quite good. Um, if anyone's got a greenhouse operation going and you start having aphid problems, this one here that I'm showing, Aphidius Irvi, you can buy those. Uh, call Even Spray on Lajamodier in Winnipeg. They will send you Aphidius Irvi, or there's, there's, they've got a whole catalog of beneficial insects, actually. Um, they will send you some of these for your greenhouse. Once you get them going, they can do a good job keeping your aphid populations low. And here's a, a parasitic wasp that we've been releasing in Manitoba. And not to worry, it is a wasp that we're releasing. It doesn't sting you. It eats only one thing, cereal leaf beetle larva. Cereal leaf beetle can be a potential pest of cereal crops. The larva can do a lot of feeding, make little streaks on the leaves like you see in the picture. Uh, it's a newer insect in Manitoba. It's been here just over a decade. When we first found it in Manitoba, we tested it for parasitism. It had 0% parasitism. So we started bringing in this parasitic wasp from Alberta where it was highly parasitized. We got it going. Some of the initial areas where this thing was establishing, a few years later, we were finding 60% parasitism. So I continue to track the progress of cereal leaf beetle in the province. Whenever I find a new population of it, I test it for parasitism. If the parasitism is low, I call my colleagues in Alberta. They send me the parasitic wasp. We do a release, and we keep track of what the percent parasitism is. It seems to take very well. The reason this happens, uh, you see two different larvae here. The larva on your right is yellow. The one on your left is black. It's black because it has, it's coated itself in its own feces, which apparently makes it distasteful to a lot of predators. But this parasite, Tetrastichus julis, it can smell chemicals from this feces from a long ways away, and it knows exactly where those cereal leaf beetle larvae are. So once it smells this, off it goes, it lays an egg into the larva, and that larva is toast. So very efficient, good predators, good parasites, so we're releasing those wherever we find them. Now I want to wrap up by giving you a few tips on things you can do to make sure you keep these good guys working in your fields. Um, first of all, if you are using insecticides, whether they're organic products or not, uh, first of all, consider do you really need to use them? Some cases, you may need to. If you do, fair game. Uh, but use them only when needed. Sometimes you don't need to be spraying a whole field or crop. You can sp spray patches or strips. That can help reduce your impact on natural enemies. And anything you can do, such as crop rotation, intercropping, to keep the bad bugs low is good. The, the less insecticide you can use, the better. So we encourage that, conventional or organic, we encourage uh, it's better for your bottom line and better for the natural enemies, the less insecticide you can use. Oops, I'm gonna go back a slide here. So here's something that may be of use if it's practical for you. These are called prairie strips. This research was initially done in Iowa and it was originally done by soil scientists because they, they wanted to find a way to minimize soil loss into our waterways and soil erosion. So they came up with this concept. What if we had maybe anywhere from 10 to 25% of our land in prairie strips running across our fields? What would that do? And so they developed a system where they were testing these and they were finding that, yeah, they were losing a lot less soil. This was great at reducing soil erosion and nutrient loss. Entomologists jumped all over that and started to look at what's this doing to our natural enemy levels in the field and our parasites and our pollinators. And in some of these prairie strips, they were finding over 70 species of pollinators and lots of ground beetles and other predators. So you do have this effect where close to that prairie strip, your natural enemy levels are way up. So that helps. They've been doing this for a long time in the United Kingdom. Their fields are a lot smaller there. And they, in the United Kingdom, they call them beetle banks because the, the initial intent over there was to produce habitat for ground beetles to help keep their aphid populations low. They've got a, an aphid there that spreads a disease that they really struggle with. And they've been looking for ways to keep this aphid in check. And so beetle banks are one of the things they use. If you need information on this, University of uh, Iowa has some good information on their website. And this is sort of what they recommend. Um, so you can see how it's done. Strip a prairie going through your crop. Uh, the goal is, again, to reduce soil erosion, provide some good habitat. Now, they were encouraging people to use native species if possible. 
Again, you've got to be practical. Whatever is going to work on your farm, I guess, is good. Um, again, they'll recommend anywhere from about uh, 10 to 25 percent of the land, but whatever is practical on your property. And um, their recommendation is anywhere from about 30 to 120 feet in width for the strip. But again, you can make it suit your purpose, whether it's 10 percent in 20 feet strips, whatever works, it might help uh, reduce some of the bad bugs, also help reduce your soil erosion. Uh, the last tip I'm going to give you, uh, the more naturalized habitat you have, if you've got shelter belts or forested areas around your property, that's good because those areas do help uh, provide habitat for a lot of natural enemies. Uh, here's one here, the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Now, unfortunately, this is the lady beetle that's also good at getting into your homes. It's not native to Manitoba. Shouldn't be here, but it was introduced, and we've got it now. And it is a very valuable natural enemy of aphids. They eat a lot of aphids. Um, but in Asia, where they originated, they're more of a forest species. They live in the forest quite a bit. And study in North America, they did find the areas that have a lot more tree cover around the fields or near the fields have more of this species and they will eat more aphids in the field in areas that have more trees. And that's not just this species. There's a lot of other species that the same thing applies to. So having some of those tree areas, whether it's a shelter belt or just an area bush near the field, that can help. And uh, last tip here, um, my talk's been more about the predators and parasitoids, but you got to be thinking pollinators when you're doing pest management. So if you ever do have to treat a field, um, be aware of pollinators that might be in the area. Honeybees are very good flyers. They will go as far as they have to to get a meal, but just because you don't have beehives right next to your yard doesn't mean that you don't have bees from a mile or so away feeding in your yard. So um, if a person does have to spray, we always uh, advise Spray as late in the day as you can. Use a product that's less, less toxic to bees and let the beekeeper know. There are some products out there that will kill things like grasshoppers and caterpillars and are totally harmless to honeybees. So if the person is spraying, we really encourage them to use one of these products. They're at least semi-selective and not something that's broad spectrum and takes out everything. So in summary, insects have a lot of roles on your farm. They can be good in many ways, so you want them around. You don't want to kill all the insects on your property. You've got some that are predators that have some pretty big appetites. You've got a lot of tiny little parasitic wasps and things flying around. So have some flowers around, have some resources to keep them going, and try to use as many strategies as you can to keep some of these beneficial insects active in your field. And there's my contact info, so if you're ever dealing with bugs on your property and you want to know are they good or bad or what can I do, you can contact me. We'll help you with that. So. so blister beetles, the question was blister beetles, are they only predatory or do they eat vegetation? And the short answer is, um, I guess there's two short answers. There's lots of different types of blister beetles. Some are strictly predaceous, some are, uh, sorry, uh, strictly uh, plant feeders, uh, most most are both plant feeders and predators. Um, the one that we saw a lot of last year was the black blister beetle, the solid black one. So as adults, they like new leaves of plants and flowers. So you will see them on your alfalfa plants feeding on the newer leaves, the flowers. You'll see them in canola fields feeding on the flowers. We don't consider them a major pest, but they are a plant feeder. As a juvenile, they eat grasshopper egg pods. So there are, that's why we saw more of them last year. Our grasshoppers have been going up. They've been responding. And uh, so, yeah, they're very valuable grasshopper predators. The shiny metallic ones that you see, the Nuttles blister beetles, they, same thing. They will feed on plant material as adults, as larvae. They feed on the larvae of ground nesting bees, which from a pollinator standpoint maybe isn't good. Um, but most blister beetles, the larvae are predators. The adults are plant feeders. It seems as though uh, flea beetle pressure has been building over the last couple of years, and they just seem to be um, a, a, a presence now. That whereas before, it, it it seemed to go more 
in waves and it was a little more random. Do you think that th that pressure is here to stay and are there any, any cultural practices to reduce their numbers? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Uh, so they're, they're both invasive species, the, the two dominant flea beetle species. We've been stuck at chronically high levels for several years and I don't see it um, tapering off too soon. The trick with flea beetles, we are dealing with invasive species here, even though they've been around for a long time. We don't have a parasitic wasp or a natural enemy that is um, uh, beneficial to the, to the point where they will just knock the cycle down like we do, like with Bertha armyworm. If you get bankus in the population, it can crash after a couple of years. We don't have an analogous natural enemy for flea beetles. People did a release in Manitoba back in the 1980s. There was a wasp called Micropletus that they tried releasing, thinking that might be maybe not the silver bullet, but something that gets them into more regular cycles. It didn't work. And right now there's nothing on the horizon as far as releases or anything. Um, there are very quick insects, so the generalist predators have trouble with them. There are a few that do eat them, but uh, lower levels. As far as cultural controls, last year some people did try seeding a bit later uh, than normal. So instead of seeding in early May, they seeded in mid-May. Um, their theory there being you get the uh, seed into um, warmer soil, you get quicker germination, quick early growth, and you can get ahead of them. That didn't work last year because we had such a dry year and even though they seeded into warmer soil, uh, things still took too long to grow. Um, for anyone doing reduced or zero tillage, flea beetles don't find that as conducive as conventional tillage. Uh, there was a good study in Alberta where they had conventional till and zero till plots next to each other and they were looking at flea beetle populations. They definitely preferred the conventional tillage the uh, zero till has a more humid, cooler environment. They didn't like it as much. But that being said, it wasn't a, it's not a silver bullet. You may have less flea beetle pressure, but you still will have some flea beetle pressure, even in the zero till situations. Down the road, they're looking at, uh, no, this probably won't be organic, but they're looking at doing something called double-stranded RNA as an insecticide. So basically they've taken the RNA of a flea beetle and they are producing an insecticide where they will spray this on the plant. The flea beetles eat these pieces of their own RNA. It silences genes within them and it kills them. It sounds really scary, but it, the, what they're doing will target just flea beetles. So if this product is a success when it comes out, in theory, it's something you'd be able to spray on your plants. It will kill only flea beetles. It won't harm anything else. That would be a good thing. But I don't know if it would, it, I mean, some, in a sense, a biological material, RNA, but I don't know if it would be organic or not. So, it's a long answer to the question. Higher, was that brick, brick levels you were? Um, no, no one's ever done the research with those insects, so hasn't been studied. <laughs>